off your shoes you're standing on my holy ground well 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 take take off your shoes you're standing on my holy ground well the earth is the lord's the fullness thereof from the waters beneath to the heavens above so take take off your shoes you're standing on my holy ground you're standing on my holy ground oh the first day of creation when the lord looked around at power plants freeways and trash on the ground plantations growing rubber where the grain should be high you couldn't see the sun for all the smog in the sky well kids you really filled the earth then you subdued it there's nothing in my books that says you've got to pollute it so take take off your shoes you're standing on my holy ground well 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 take take off your shoes you're standing on my holy ground well the earth is the lord's the fullness thereof from the waters beneath to the heavens above so take take off your shoes you're standing on my holy ground you're standing on my holy ground You've heated up my rivers with your plants and your mills. You're killing off my oceans with your waste and your spills. You're fishing like there'll always be an endless supply. And fighting one another for what's well, left to divide. You didn't want advice when I gave you dominion. You made me be timing for a second opinion. So take, take off your shoes. You're standing on my holy ground. Well, 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 take, take off your shoes. You're standing on my holy ground. Well, the earth is the Lord's, the fullness thereof. From the waters beneath to the heavens above. So take, take off your shoes. You're standing on my holy ground. You're standing on my holy ground. I dig your scientific mind, but use them with care. You're breaking down my ozone layer up in the air. You're hyped up farming, turning soils into stone. And some don't eat meat while they don't get bones. I told you to be fruitful and you sure multiplied, but the rich took the land and learned to divide. So take, take off your shoes, you're standing on my holy ground. Everybody, take, take off your shoes, you're standing on my holy ground. Well, the earth is the Lord's, the fullness thereof. The water beneath to the heavens above. So take, take off your shoes. You're standing on my holy ground. You're standing on my holy ground. You're standing on my holy ground. you join with me in prayer? And now 
may the, the words of our mouths and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. So as most of you know, uh, I spent two years in the Philippines, 2007 and 2008, when I was a, a young adult working with the general board of Global Ministries. And I returned, uh, I returned to the southern Philippines multiple times after that, once as a an election observer with the United Nations, and another time on a delegation that, that our, our bishop sent to be in solidarity with farm workers um, after, uh, after a massacre that happened on the southern island of Mindanao. And the, the last time, the most recent time I was there, I was, I was already a, a pastor at that point, and uh, Filipinos have a really different relationship with clergy uh, than Americans do. So... Um, here in, in the U.S., it's, more, it's a little more like indentured servitude, and there it's something very, very different. And so I was, I was there visiting, and I was sort of stunned at the different relationship I had with, with people, people I'd known before, who now saw me as a, somehow a different and somewhat sanctified person. And, and so at some point, we were, we were gathering together in the community square, and someone said, you know, we're going to gather there tomorrow and we want you to offer a prayer. I thought, okay, I need to like really, really do this prayer, like a lot. So I, I stayed up that evening and I wrote which, what is probably the best prayer I have ever written. I mean, it had like, um, it had the word tehom in it, which is the Hebrew word for the primordial ooze that we were formed out of. I mean, you know it's going to be a good prayer when it has the word tehom in it. And then there was, uh, there was lots of alliteration. It was going to be pertinent, persuasive, and positively poignant. This was going to be a tight prayer that people would be praying about and thinking about for months to come. It was multiple paragraphs, single-spaced. They were going to love this. Of course, when we got to the time in which I would pray, it was like real hot. Like so hot that even the Filipinos there were sweating and were complaining that it was hot. Also, I had sort of expected that it would, it would be people from the community who also knew English, and that wasn't the case. And fortunately, there was a, a translator there, but if you've ever tried to work through a, a translator, the thing is I got really caught up in the cadence of this great prayer, and so I just went the whole way through all five paragraphs while this young man who was going to translate for me is like standing there befuddled. And so I got to the end, and he said, okay, can you just say that in Visayan for us? It had been a long time since I had used that language, and even then, I was not very good at creating complex sentences, let alone using words like poignant and pertinent. And so I prayed a prayer that basically translates as, Jesus, 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 we love you. Help, help, help. Also, I couldn't decide on the correct pronunciation for Jesus in Visayan, and my conjugation was bad. So it really sounded like, Jesus, Jesu, Jehovah, we loves you, to help helping helped. <laughs> to help helping helped Jesus teach us to pray. Jesus, teach us to pray, these disciples ask. And this question, solely in the context of the story, should strike us as a little odd, why would it be strange for Jesus' disciples to be asking him to teach them how to pray? Anyone have a thought on that? They've been praying a long time. They're all observant Jews from Palestine. Not only have they been praying a long time, they've memorized most of the Psalms and they know how to mix and match. They have a prayer 
for every occasion, these early followers of Jesus. So it's important for us to remember that the Gospels are not factual accounts of the narrative of Jesus's life. They are stories written about Jesus for a specific audience that the writer has in mind. The Gospel of Luke was written for Gentiles, for Greco-Roman Gentiles in particular, and their understanding of religion was a little more about sacrificing animals and a little less about self-reflection. So they actually did not know what it meant to pray. They did not understand what it was to, to pray in a deeply monotheistic context like Jesus would have been coming from. And so Jesus offers them this prayer, these words through this story. The Lord's Prayer is certainly the foundation of the Christian faith. It's also a deeply Jewish prayer. It mirrors uh, the Amidah. Does anyone know what this prayer is, the Amidah? It's a prayer that observant Jews pray three times a day. It does not include the word tehom, so I should have taken that as a consideration. That prayer uh, does many things, offers many blessings about the word, about the world. It honors first and foremost the holiness of who God is and reminds the person praying that as they are in need of forgiveness, they are also called to forgive one another. Jesus, teach us how to pray. And Jesus says this is the simple prayer. Honor who God is first. And remember that you, who are loved by God, are also fallible. Early on in ministry, I thought I would receive a lot more requests like this. I thought, yeah, I had this vision of like what it would look like, and I imagine I'd be sitting in my office, and someone would come in and would just be like, teach me how to pray, right? That was the, the vision of what ministry would look like. Now, in nine years of this work, only one time has someone asked me to teach them how to pray, I opted not to share my Jesus, Jesu, Jehovah, help, helping, helped uh, story with them. Just once I received that, that request to teach us how to pray. And that's because I think that request takes a lot for granted. Our, our question in our social context is not how do we pray our question as, as people of relative privilege lo living post-European uh, enlightenment, our question is, why should we bother praying? Why should we bother praying? First of all, the, the, most of this passage doesn't really feel like it holds too much water for us. I would be stunned I would be stunned if, if more than maybe one or two of us in this room really believed that whatever we ask, God will give to us. Logically, it seems impossible because I know for a fact that people pray and simultaneously ask for opposite things at the same time to happen. So, like, is there a multiverse in which God is answering multiple prayers at once? If so, that's a movie franchise that, I mean, I would enjoy. I can't imagine it being made, but... Um, but it doesn't work rationally, right, for God to answer, answer prayer in this way. And even if there weren't this impossible conundrum of, of whose prayer to answer, we don't really think that God acts this way. Most of us don't. If we believe that God has the capacity still to take action in the world, and for some of us, not me, but for some of us, that's an if. If we believe that God has the capacity to take action in the world, what kind of God will only help people who ask? What kind of God will only help people who ask and who ask with persistence or who ask other people to ask for them? What kind of God responds to nagging and lobbying? Who is this God? Nagging and lobbying also simultaneously never worked on my parents as a child, so why should it work on the Lord? Why should we pray to that kind of holy parents? At a, a gun violence protest, now it's been a few years back, 
I saw a sign you, you've probably seen before. It was this poster board, and it had the phrase thoughts and prayers written on it, and then that was X'd out. And underneath, it said action and change. I think when I saw the person, I made a snide comment and said, you know, you're right, America gave up thinking a long time ago. Um, she didn't laugh. It wasn't a, anyway. Um, but I get, I get where she was coming from. That, that phrase, right, thoughts and prayers in that context, often he feels hollow because when someone says they'll pray on, on something, especially, especially public officials, it, it, it sometimes seems like a bit of a, a cop-out. All too often, I feel like prayer is misused as an excuse for, for inaction, right? But also, I think prayer is sometimes an excuse because of something that um, Bishop Shelby Spong writes. He, he said, basically, we, we shouldn't tell people we're going to pray for them because most of the time we don't do it. We shouldn't tell people we're going to pray for them because most people don't actually sit down and pray. It's deeply nihilistic. I mean, my, my goodness, it's like saying we shouldn't have a produce section at the grocery store because most of us aren't going to really cook those vegetables and eat them anyway. I mean, I think it's deeply <laughs> nihilistic. And by the end of his life, Bishop Spong was suggesting that we shouldn't bother praying at all. Recently, I called a, a friend who is a parent. She's a parent of, of a, a teenager. And when I called my friend, she was clearly in her minivan and... Um, I said, how are you doing? And she said, this has been a day. Say more, I said. They were driving to the AT&T store to disconnect her daughter's cell phone. It wasn't enough based on what the, the original sin had been at the beginning of this conversation. I didn't get into that. You know, this kid has a right to their own privacy, right? Um, whatever the offense was that the teenager had committed, it wasn't enough, it wasn't enough for this child's mother to, to take the phone away. There needed to be a, a, a moment of, of, of public reckoning in which the phone was disconnected and rendered useless, perhaps never to be used again. It was a scorched earth moment in that household. I got off the phone really fast because that's not my pig and that's not my farm. I don't need to, to be a part of that. I was worried, though, about how my friend was doing because she was really, really angry. And she had said in the, the phone call that she was disconnecting the phone because her primary responsibility as a parent was to make sure that her daughter grew up understanding that there are consequences for things in the world. When I called back later that day, she was in the car again. She was sitting in the car outside of the grocery store, and her daughter the same daughter who they had been in this explosion earlier, was in the grocery store buying things they were going to cook together for dinner because after the phone explosion, when the daughter broke down and cried, they had a moment of sitting on the couch and talking and remembering how much they loved each other. And even though the phone had not been returned, they were going to spend some time together this evening making macaroni and cheese my friend corrected herself and said, you know, actually, my, my primary responsibility as a parent is not to make sure that my child understands there are consequences for her action. My primary responsibility as a parent is to stay in relationship with my child, always, often, even when I'm angry, especially when I'm angry. My primary responsibility is to stay in relationship with this child for the duration of their life. I don't, I don't know what kind of relationship Bishop Spong had with his parents. I don't know why it would, it would be that someone who is a leader in the church would say, why should we bother praying? But if you know anything about me, you know that I'm not one to get too attached to the, the musings of higher-ups and uh, institutional leadership. If... If I'm going to ask someone, how should I pray, I will probably not ask a bishop. I'd rather ask a monk or a nun instead. 
Brother Henry Nowen writes that Western Christians are better at talking and thinking about God because we cannot descend from our head to our heart. He said the journey between the head and the heart is a 7,000-mile journey for a white person. He himself was a white Canadian, so that's like the whitest white. He understood what was happening. He also said that the reason we cannot descend from our mind to our heart is because the mind is where we master and control. The mind is where we are in charge. The heart is where we are soft and vulnerable. How should we pray? I would ask Brother Henry Nowen. He would say you should pray first by descending from your mind to your heart. The Benedictine nuns in the southern Philippines, like, like many monastic orders, pray five times a day together, and their last prayer that they pray at 11 o'clock before they retire, they always end their prayer by praying for those who go to bed hungry and praying for those who live alone. I asked a sister about those prayers once, and she said, well, it's give us this day our daily bread she said she doesn't speculate too much on God's will, but that part about everyone having daily bread seems to be right in the text. And so if we want God's will to be done on earth, we must make sure that every person each day has what they need to survive. They pray that prayer in the evening immediately before they retire, she says. So it's the first thing on her mind when she gets up in the morning. How can I be a part of everyone receiving daily bread today? She also says that they, they pray last before bed for all those who live alone with the hope at least that lest those people have no one else to pray for them, they know that they are held by God and held by us. Prayer, according to both, both the passage from Luke and from the wider portrait of Jesus, is not primarily about getting things from God. It's not about lobbying or nagging. It is about about understanding what our relationship with God is and staying in relationship with God no matter what. This understanding of our relationship with God, our being in relationship with God, drives the relationship that we have with each other. When I talk to, to progressives, when I talk to activists who are more secular in nature, I always say, you know, the reason that I pray is that I need to remember every day that God is God so that I remember that I am not God. God is God. I am not. It is not my will that is to be done among others, nor is it my responsibility to save anyone. God is God. I am not. And that pulls everything into alignment for me because when I remember that I am loved and held, I must I must remember that you are loved and held and that we are loved and held in the same substance and so we are bound and beholden to each other. Even when we fail one another, there is one that still loves us. Jesus, teach us how to pray. That prayer, the, the Amada, that the Lord's Prayer is, is uh, based on literally means, the word Amada literally means standing. It means on your feet. So when answering the question how to pray, Jesus is in some sense saying, do it with brevity. So probably not pertinent and poignant, right? Do it with brevity. Do it with urgency. Do it embodied. If, if we are spending too much time praying in our heads, we are probably doing it wrong. The prayer that, that I, I offered on that very hot day among very cranky people is, is far from the best prayer I have ever offered. I think I burned that text at some point and pledged never to use the word Tay home again. But now, what, I've said it like seven times in this sermon, so, you know, best laid plans. I don't know if there's a best prayer that I've prayed, but I, I do know a time in my life that, that prayer worked. A number of years back, I had a, a colleague with whom I had a very strained relationship. 
I knew you would find this shocking that pastors don't all get along with each other, but it, it's true. We do it differently, and sometimes we don't always play nicely. And I had a very strained relationship with this person. And at some point, I said to them, we'll all be praying for you. Ooh, what a passive, aggressive, and terrible thing to say. So I then, having read the words of Bishop Spong and resenting them, said, well, I am going to pray for that person. I'm going to do it every day. And I prayed a a prayer that I learned from a friend once, which is, um, bless them, change me. That's, That's the prayer to pray for your enemy. Bless them, change me. And I prayed it at first for weeks with clenched teeth. Bless her heart, Lord, which is not saying bless her. Change me, right? Over and over and over. It actually got to the point where I wasn't even really thinking about it anymore when I sat down to, to pray. This person, their name was first on my list before I prayed about anything. Weeks passed. Months passed. You know, finally my anger set. I began to see maybe the ways I'm not always an easy person to work with. I began to see that actually sometimes there are just certain personalities that don't connect I began to see the ways in which perhaps I was smug and judgmental, and I just set it aside. A couple of months ago, I I heard through the grapevine that this person had had a terrible tragedy within their family, devastating out out of what is natural alignment of loss kind of tragedy. And I wondered what it would be like for me, for me to reach out to them. Would they want to hear from me? Would I have anything to offer? And I I just sent a text message. But I realized after I sent it that there was no no passive aggressive. There was no malice. There was no judgment. There was nothing in the words I sent. There was only the intention and concern I would have for any other human being, right, who had experienced loss. And that person was able to respond to me. Instead of me reading into every word that came and seeing the way that person was judging me, or I was able to just see, oh, this is a person in in grief. This is a human being. And I don't know that there will be a day in which we're going to, like, hang out and go to the beach and be best friends. But this world has so much brokenness and hate and resentment in it. Any any time that prayer can lead us to a place of reconciliation and love, that's, that's a holy miracle. If that's not God actively at work in the world, I don't know. I don't know what is. If that's not the healing of this planet, the beginning of healing in our lives, I don't know. I don't know what is. Jesus, teach us to pray. If you're someone who, who doesn't know, how to pray, I just commend that prayer to you. I just had that person on a list of, of people for whom I knew I needed to pray, and I just said their names in the morning, first thing, just to change my own heart, just to show up with the expectation that I needed to be transformed in that relationship, just so that even if there was no one else thinking about and holding those people, they would maybe in some sense know that they were loved and held by God and loved and held by me. And so when, when we pray, I'd advise against words like poignant and pertinent. I'd advise an open heart. I'd advise coming from the space of vulnerability and showing up in prayer, expecting that the transformation of the world that God brings will start first and foremost with us. Amen.